Chan Shear, I'm a consultant haematologist at Sir Charles Gardner and Hollywood Private Hospitals in Perth in Western Australia. Follicular lymphoma is the most common slow-growing lymphoma. It makes up around 25% of all lymphoma diagnoses or probably around 1,500 to 2,000 patients a year in, in Australia. Um, the, uh, average, the median age of diagnosis is around 60 years of age and uh, it again like, like most lymphomas patients normally uh, feel a, an enlarged lymph node uh, which prompts them um, to go and see their, their GP and the diagnosis is made on the basis of a biopsy, ideally a, an, what we call an excisional biopsy where a surgeon takes a small um, piece of lymph node tissue out and we look at it under the microscope. So the question was, do all patients with follicular lymphoma have symptoms at the time of diagnosis? Um, the short answer to that question is no, and particularly with follicular lymphoma, I mean, many patients notice a lump, um, which is the first thing that, that leads them to um, seek medical attention. But because follicular lymphoma is a slow-growing lymphoma, um, other patients can be diagnosed um, completely free from symptoms on the basis of a, C a scan, normally a CT scan, um, performed for another reason. Say someone has abdominal pain um, and their GP organises a scan of their abdomen to look for um, their gallbladder or something and some enlarged lymph nodes are picked up. So that's another way that patients with uh, follicular lymphoma are often diagnosed. So the question is how long patients may have uh, follicular lymphoma prior to their diagnosis. Because follicular lymphoma is a slow growing lymphoma, um, the lymph nodes increase in size gradually over months to years. So it's not uncommon when I first meet patients for them to tell me that they've had this, these enlarged glands present for many months, even a year or two, um, prior to seeking medical attention. Um, and uh, it's sometimes the case that patients with follicular lymphoma um, have other symptoms as well, such as fevers, um, drenching sweats at night time and um, weight loss, but that happens less frequently than in uh, patients with aggressive lymphomas like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So the question is, what, what, what are the causes of follicular lymphoma? Much like other sub subtypes of lymphoma, we don't know why the majority of patients uh, develop follicular lymphoma. Um, we know that there are risk factors and some of those risk factors overlap with other types of lymphoma such as diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, um, suppression of the immune system, um, a family history of follicular lymphoma and prior exposure to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. But um, honestly, in the, in the majority of patients that, that we see, um, no clear risk factors um, are, are present. So the question is how we manage early stage follicular lymphoma. Uh, and, and this is an interesting question because um, the, the management has uh, changed slightly in the last few years on the basis of a, uh, a fairly large study which was performed by Australian and New Zealand investigators led by uh, Michael McManus at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. So uh, let me talk about what limited stage follicular lymphoma is. Um, in the staging system for lymphoma, uh, you can be staged between stage one and stage four. Patients with stage one and stage two follicular lymphoma, meaning one or two lymph node areas um, on one or two respectively lymph node areas on the same side of the diaphragm or breathing muscle, um, have what we call limited stage um, follicular lymphoma. These are the minority of patients with follicular lymphoma, only about 10 to 15 percent, um, depending on which study you look at. The outcomes of these patients appears to be highly favourable and um, in tra traditionally th these patients received radiation alone and probably something like 60 to 70 percent of patients were potentially cured using radiation alone. Now um, there was a reasonably uh, reasonably large um, Australian study in which patients were randomised to either radiation alone or radiation with um, a chemotherapy program called CVP with rituximab. And the results of this study uh, suggested that for patients who have had radiation therapy plus the addition of um, this chemotherapy with rituximab, RCVP, 
um, they, they appeared to have a, a, lo a longer pr what we call progression-free survival, or in other words, it looked like the lymphoma stayed away for longer. And that was largely due to a reduction in the risk of the lymphoma coming back outside the, the area of the body that was uh, given the radiation, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, so on the, there was no difference in overall survival in that study. So on the basis of that, um, many of us are um, offering patients, particularly those who are younger, um, under, under 60 years of age, um, ra radiation plus the addition of um, RCVP chemotherapy afterward on the basis of these results. The question is, is, follicular, is limited stage follicular lymphoma curable? Um, so the short answer to that is probably yes. Um, follicular lymphoma in limited stage is probably the one exception to the, ru the, the rule where um, uh, we, most of us consider follicular lymphoma to be a, a type of uh, blood cancer which is treatable but not curable because you administer chemotherapy with rituximab to patients. Uh, they almost always go into remission, but then it almost always returns at some point. But patients with limited stage uh, follicular lymphoma may be the one exception to that rule, um, and particularly the, when uh, radiotherapy is used um, w with or without um, RCVP, it appears that um, a reasonable proportion of patients, perhaps as high as 70%, if, it's stage, if we're talking about stage one follicular lymphoma, are cured the cure rate is probably slightly lower for stage two. What is the management for patients with advanced stage follicular lymphoma? Well, this uh, really depends on the presence of um, symptoms related to follicular lymphoma. And the, the symptoms are basically, as, as we've alluded to earlier, the presence of um, rapidly enlarging lymph glands, uh, the presence of an enlarged liver or a large spleen, um, the, pres uh, the presence of um, low um, blood counts. So follicular lymphoma can get into the bone marrow and cause um, a reduction in your haemoglobin or your red blood cells or, and your platelets, or, which are cells which help you to form clots. And if that happens, um, that constitutes a reason to give treatment. Uh, if you have uh, fevers or sweats or weight loss because of your lymphoma, then we consider that to be a reason to give treatment as well. And if the lymphoma gets into fluid, which is around the um, heart or in the abdomen or in the lungs, then that's a reason to give treatment as well. If a lymphoma is causing compression of something, so for instance, if you have a large lymph node which is squashing um, a, a blood vessel and causing a blood clot or pushing on a nerve, that would be a reason to give treatment. And uh, if there was a high number of lymphoma cells floating around in the blood, we also use that as a reason to start treatment. Finally, there are a group of patients with follicular lymphoma who have um, very large um, lymph nodes in the body uh, when we do a scan. And um, we know that, for instance, patients with a single lymph node which is greater than seven centimetres in size, or three lymph nodes which are greater than three centimetres in size, which is about the size of a squash ball, then that, uh, we, would, we would consider that a reason to start treatment as well. So these are collectively known as the GELF criteria, named after the, the French group who um, described them. The question is whether all, all patients with follicular lymphoma need immediate treatment. And the short answer to that is no, most patients uh, do not need treatment. I would say that the majority of patients with follicular lymphoma uh, can, don't have any of these uh, criteria uh, for starting treatment at the time that they're first diagnosed. The, um, uh, we know that a proportion of patients with advanced stage follicular lymphoma, particularly if you're older, may be observed for many years without needing therapy. Probably the average is about two or three years before needing treatment. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are some patients who present with uh, one of those um, symptoms and do need um, immediate, uh, immediate treatment. So the question is whether there are, there are patients with follicular lymphoma who never need treatment. Yes, yes, there, there are certainly patients with very, um, a, a very small amount of follicular lymphoma, um, who, uh, particularly who are m maybe older, and, um, who may never require treatment for their follicular lymphoma. It's the minority of uh, patients. Uh, most patients will need treatment at some point uh, in their lives, but there are a, a lucky few who will never need treatment, yes. So the question is what the, what the names of treatment regimens used in the frontline front management of follicular lymphoma are. 
Um, this, um, again, is an area which has uh, undergone quite a lot of change in the, in the Australian context in the last um, six to 12 months. Um, the, there are, let, let me talk about the chemotherapy first. There are, in Australia, there are three, mo three main chemotherapy um, programs which we use. Um, one is called CHOP, um, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristine and prednisolone. Um, this is a, a very common lymphoma regimen. We also use it for patients with high grade or uh, large cell lymphoma. Um, the second chemotherapy program is called CVP, or, um, which is the same as CHOP, but it subtracts one drug, um, doxorubicin, which is the red one, um, which uh, is slightly gentler um, in terms of lower risk of infection, um, lower risk of hair loss, uh, slightly less effective in terms of its uh, ability to control the lymphoma, but um, more suitable for older patients. The third chemotherapy uh, which we use uh, is called bendamustine, which uh, again is, is given as an infusion. And again, uh, in, in contrast to CHOP and CVP, which are given once every three weeks, bendamustine is given on two consecutive days, once every 28 days or once a month. Um, bendamustine uh, has the advantages of causing less um, hair loss, so it doesn't cause hair loss typically, unlike CHOP in particular. Uh, and it causes less problems with um, a side effect called neuropathy, where patients get uh, tingling or numbness in their fingers or toes. But it does appear to be associated with a slightly higher risk of uh, infection, um, particularly in patients over the age of 70. So it's a little bit of a trade-off, and your doctor will talk to you about what the most appropriate chemotherapy program might be. The second answer to, that, to, the, second answer to the question is the monoclonal antibody. Um, a monoclonal antibody is a, uh, a medicine which is, uh, uh, binds to a protein called CD20 on the outside of a follicular lymphoma cell or, or any B cell lymphoma, to be honest. And it attracts the, um, the immune system. So it really, it's a form of immunotherapy. It binds to the outside of a lymphoma cell and it then attracts the, um, your own immune system to attack the, the cancer. We're, they work quite well in combination with chemotherapy. Um, the, the commonest one, uh, the one that's been around for the last 20 years, is called rituximab, um, and it's very effective in follicular lymphoma. It works well uh, when given with any of those chemotherapy programs. Um, more recently, there's been a, a large randomized uh, study in which investigators compared rituximab with chemotherapy to a new antibody called obinutuzumab, uh, or Gaziva, uh, with chemotherapy, um, followed by um, two years of maintenance with the same treatment. And to cut a long story short, th this study showed a, an advantage in terms of um, progression-free survival, which means that patients that lymphoma stayed away slightly longer um, in uh, patients who were treated with this new antibody called abinutuzumab um, compared with the old antibody rituximab. There was a slightly higher um, risk of infection related to this, uh, the, the, the newer antibody, uh, but it did result in around about a 30% reduction in the risk of lymphoma uh, returning. Um, however, there was no difference in overall survival in this study. What is the prognosis of follicular lymphoma? Um, the, 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 again, the answer to this question depends on um, the presence of um, some specific features, um, prognostic factors which can be put into a scoring system um, that, that gives patients an idea of what their outcome with uh, treatment is likely to be. In follicular lymphoma, that scoring system is called the uh, FLIPI score, or Follicular Lymphoma International Prognostic Index. There are a couple of variants of this. Um, uh, they take into account, um, they measure two things basically. One is how much lymphoma you have, and two, um, how strong or how fit is the patient. Um, it, we can basically take these features and plug them into a scoring system and, and then divide people into a, a very good and intermediate and a high risk um, from their lymphoma and we're able to slightly refine the prognosis that way.